Hey, this is Zach Log the Great, and I am here tonight with my friend Nate. Yo. And uh, Travis. Hello. And we are getting together tonight to um, talk about um, the poem Man's Short Life and Foolish Ambition by uh, Duchess Margaret Cavendish. Um, and um, I do want to say, before we get to that, uh, say uh, thank you to uh, Disenchanted Scholar uh, for uh, pointing this out to me. Um, and you can find her uh, interesting and odd uh, blog at uh, disenchantedscholar.wordpress.com, and I will uh, link that. And um, also, I wanted to say a uh, thank you to my uh, subscribe star, some of my subscribe star supporters, to Ann H, JB14, and Dead Messenger. Um, thank you for um, continuing to uh, support me. And if anyone is interested, you can do the same yourself. That it, that is going to be um, there is going to be a link in the description. So. Um, having said that, um, Travis has volunteered to, uh, be our reader for tonight, so I am going to put the poem up, and, oh, oh here, wait a moment, there we go, I am going to put the poem up, wait, sorry, technical problems, there we go, let me know when you guys see that, there yep, it is. got it. Okay, and uh, as I said, uh, Travis is going to uh, read for us tonight. Okay, Man's Short Life and Foolish Ambition by Duchess of Newcastle, Margaret Cavendish. In garden sweet, each flower marked did I, how they did spring, bud, blow, wither, and die. With that, contemplating of man's short stay, Saw man like to those flowers pass away. Yet built he houses thick and strong and high as if he'd lived to all eternity. Hoards up a mass of wealth yet cannot fill his empty mind, but covet will he still. To gain or keep such falsehood will he use. Wrong, right, or truth no base ways will refuse. I would not blame him could he death outkeep or ease his pains, or be secure of sleep, or buy heaven's mansions like the gods become, and with his gold rule, stars and moon and sun. Command the winds to blow, see their breezes stay, but he no power hath unless to die, and care in life is only misery. This care is but a word, an empty sound, wherein there is no soul nor substance found. Yet as his heir, he makes it to inherit, and all he has he leaves unto this spirit. To get this child of fame and this bare word, he fears no dangers, neither fire nor sword. All horrid pains and death he will endure, for anything can he but fame procure. O oh man, O oh man, what high ambition grows within his brain, and yet how low he goes. To be contented only with a sound, wherein is neither peace, nor life, nor body found. Okay, thank you, Travis. So, uh, Nate, would you like to uh, kick us off with your initial thoughts on this one tonight? In relation to the first couple lines, it makes me think of uh, the song Who Am I by Mercy Me. It's in the same kind of idea, except for instead of being like, hey, maybe, you know, don't spend all your time worrying about temporal blessings. It talks about, you know, this exact same thing that it makes the same exact connection that, you know, we are, you know, flowers blown, you know, and, you know, withering every moment. Uh, and it points out that even because of that, you know, even, you know, in the face of that, God still loves us. And other than that, I'm like, I feel like I, I, I kind of 
came to this a long time ago, this idea that, yeah, you know, maybe don't spend all your time just going after fame and cash. And so I just kind of read it and was like, yep. So you'd be, so you'd be a terrible rapper is what you're saying. Uh, I mean, from a lyrical sense, I'd do all right, but yeah, I ain't got the (laughs) hustle. I, I, I ain't about that hustle. Yo. As the youth might say, Nate, could you please be? I don't be any... concerned with those dollar dollar bills. Nate, could you please be any whiter? Can you try? Well, <laughs> you know, guys, I can tell you, whenever you're out there facing those Benjamins, you just gotta watch out for the gangsters. Don't want to cross those guys. Oh. <laughs> okay. Chalk outlines. That's <laughs> your skin, I guess. I don't know. I'll, uh, <laughs> we keep we keep going on this. I'm gonna have to uh, gonna have to uh, see if I can uh, bring a Weird Al song up. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, yeah. I thought, you know it's it's a worthy point to make. That you know, and all <laughs> the first thing you need to get before you you know go out there and get paper is get a purpose. You know, if if money is the whole purpose, then you, there is not one. Because I mean, you can have as much money as you want, but you'll never find any satisfaction in it because you know, money is a means, and having all the means in the world if there is no end is well. It's, I can't think of a better way to say it, so I'm just going to lay it out. It's frankly masturbatory. Well, it now see this actually reminds me of a joke I learned uh, years and years ago that is um is the kind of joke that is funny and also has a a kind of serious point. Um, so I, I'll, I'll try to make this quick, but yeah. So you know, one day this uh, very rich man. Okay, you've heard. You can't take it with you. Well. I won't go into details because none of us have the resources to make this happen. But this very rich man managed to make a deal with God that he could bring one suitcase full of whatever he wanted to heaven with him. And um, so, you know, he dies. And, you know, he arrives at the the pearly gates and, you know, St. Peter is there and uh, says, uh, hey, uh, uh, welcome. Welcome, sir. Uh, uh, That suitcase. I'm sorry. But you can't bring anything with you. And the man said, no, no, I, I, I have a deal. And uh, St. Peter said, you, you have a deal? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, so St. Peter sends one of the angels nearby uh, to go check on this. And uh, after a minute, the, the angel comes back and says, yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, God said he's good. He can bring that suitcase in with him. And uh, St. Peter said, okay. And uh, one of the... Uh, and as he's about to go in, uh, uh, one of the angel says, excuse me, sir, I hope you don't mind, but can we just look at what you have in that suitcase? I'm kind of curious. And the man opens it up, and the suitcase is just full of gold bars. And the angel says, oh, okay. And, you know, the guy goes in. And he, he closes, uh, and, uh, you know, after he goes in, uh, the angel turns to St. Peter and says, so... Why do you suppose he decided to bring pavement? <laughs> I heard a slightly different version of that. So the rich man, you know, he, he had stacked up all this money and all that. And he said he was determined that, you know what? I'm going to set up a suitcase in the attic. And when I die, I'm going to grab it on the way up. What are they going to do? Tell me, tell me to put it back. They can't send me back. So one late one night he dies and. In the morning, his wife goes up in the attic and finds the suitcase still there and says, I was worried about this. I told I, I should have told him to put it in the basement. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Uh... <sighs> but anyway, um, but to uh, to uh, as we say here, to get back to the poem, um, I one thing I um 
I like about this poem, and I actually just did a uh, Robert Service poem that you know falls in the same category. Um, it's kind of uh, you know one of those. Uh, it covers one of those you know kind of three or four topics uh, that everyone needs you know to think about. Everyone needs to you know get some kind of handle on, and you know, and I think this is part of what poetry is here for. And you know, there there's you know love. God and and death. And, you know, you got to think about these things and, you know, you got to you have to you know, you have to live your life in light of the fact that, by the way, it's going to end. Um, and, you know. I think. A lot of our society today is dedicated to uh, distract, trying to distract people from that. And, um, you know, a lot of people try as hard as possible to avoid thinking about that instead of figuring out what to do with it. Um, yeah. So that's and so that's a lot of what, you know, they're talking about here. And it's why I kind of liked it is because. Yeah, you know, it, it's what is your purpose? What is your point? You know, what is worth pursuing, what is not. Like I said, I feel like this doesn't cover, doesn't pertain to death nearly so much as the fourth thing, which is purpose. It's God, life, death, purpose. Or sorry, God, love, death, and purpose. Because, I mean, I think honestly you should think about purpose before you think about love, because that'll help you figure out what kind of love you want. Yeah, I think but, uh, I think the purpose. I don't know. The purpose seems to be a key a key point there. I guess I, I somewhat had a, a little bit of a problem with kind of where she went with it or the way it came out, and that's probably just my particular response to it. But she's she's sort of putting man down for having ambition and saying what a fool. I mean, it's in the title, foolish ambition. Um, and yet she starts out by talking about the flower and the flower's ambition is just as foolish. Well, it's, it's also, uh, but she doesn't say the flower is not foolish. The, the whole thing about the flower is they're here and they're gone really quickly. And, you know, right. on, on a certain time scale, you can say the same thing about men. Um, right. Exactly. And so, um, you know, one other thing I kind of like about this is like, you know, people do all these things um, to, to, you know, get wealth. And she says, um, you know, uh, to gain or keep such falsehood will he use wrong, right, or truth. It's like it, whatever, whatever is going to do it, whatever is going to get me the power, whatever is going to get me the money, I will, um, I am, you know, quite happy to embrace that. Um, said Hillary Clinton. Um, and then, um, and then, well, you know, not just her, but, you know, she's a good, you could, you could say that about quite a few politicians on both sides. But anyway, um, and she, she says, you know, I would not blame him could he death out keep or ease his pains or be secure of sleep. It's like, okay, if by doing all these things, by using every crooked trick, in your power by you know by lying or damaging other people if you have to if you could manage to not die okay i'd see i'd i'd understand that or if you could even you know keep off pain you know keep away suffering or um what's the third what's it say or or even so much as you know sleep well <laughs> uh and but like, you know, we, you know, however much money you have, there's certain things you're not getting around. And it's like, so, you know, you can't do these things. You don't, you know, all this money doesn't make you a god. So why are you doing that? What are you doing this for? It's like, yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, there are the proverbs that say that a wise man leaves a, you know, leaves a legacy to his children. And, you know, it speaks in one part to inheritance, another part, hopefully, to the wisdom part of that. 
But I mean, you also think about it. This is not necessarily even people that are going out there and doing, you know, underhanded, cruel, or, you know, morally ambiguous or reprehensible things. This also is the, the guys that go out there and work 80 hours a week. You know, that they only ever see their kids with the head on the pillow, you know, and they never get to spend time with them. You know, never take a night off to have a date with their wife. That kind of stuff. These people that burn themselves up trying to have, you know, trying to get things and to have the things. But, I mean, ultimately, it's it, it kind of comes off a little hollow, you know. The kids got the nicest bike on the street, but you never taught them how to ride it. You know, uh, your kid, you know, your wife drives the nicest car, but she's always in there by herself. I mean, like I said, it's one of these things I thought about a long time ago. I thought about purpose and realized that I said, the first thing I want is to be around because I realized when I was in my late teens that it was only in the last couple of years I really got to know my dad. Dad wasn't an absentee father. You know, he never ran out on us. He was just always working because, well, he never made that much money, so he had to put in the hours. He was a he was a trucker for a long time, hauling, you know, crane parts and crude oil, and so he was always just on the road. He was out working. We didn't see him most days. And so I really, you know, when I started getting to be about, like, in, a, in my middle teens, he, he got injured out of that job. Like, he, he couldn't do it anymore, so he had to do something else. And so I got to see him a lot more. And I realized that, you know, man, and, and it kind of gave me a pang to realize that I really enjoy spending time with him and, you know, even working alongside of him and hanging out with him. But I wish we could have been doing this for the previous, you know decade and a half would have been really great and like i said i don't begrudge him all of it and you know it's not like he chose that he wanted to do that it's just what he had to do but i decided that whatever i did i was not going to do something that would take me away from my wife and kids once i eventually had them the same way that dad's job took him away i have largely managed to keep that And so yeah, I sleep a lot because I'm, you know, with Rachel and the, you know. And it's a, it's a hard thing because, like, at the same time, like you need, you want to, you know, provide for your kids and make sure they have, you know, enough to be secure and safe. And you know, you also want to spend time with them and you know take care of them emotionally and. You know, it's kind of the nature of the world that these two things compete with each other. And it's... Um, I mean, I know. could definitely be making more money. But we have what we need. Yeah, and, you know... If uh, they might not... You know, they might not see it that way now, but if you ask your kids, like, you know, 10, 15 years from now, you know, which would you rather have, you know, another, you know, which would you rather have when you were a kid, another two hours with dad or another, you know, game for your Xbox? And, you know, Uh, what's that? I don't want to ask him that question. (laughs) <laughs> I said they might not quite catch that. They might not catch it, you know, just yet. Might not but, get the um, answer you'd like to. Yeah. You know, at the moment, at the moment, they might not you know, value things quite the same way. But looking back, I'm pretty sure, you know, you know which way that will be answered. And it's, um, and so, like, you know, figuring out, you know, finding you know where that where that balance belongs. That's that's pretty important. Um, although you know, it all that also changes if uh, if you know, for instance, you're able to have one parent who's just home, uh, and then if you because if you can do that, the other parent can work like crazy if they need to, uh, and that will and and things are 
still probably going to be okay. Um, so, uh, how about you, Travis? What's what, what's your uh, what's your first thoughts on this one? Um, give me a minute. I'm changing rooms to see if that stops the uh, wonkiness. So, talk about the poem, and I'll get back issue. to you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, but you know, and but like it says, you know, we, you know, we try to amass this wealth and this, you know, worldly power, but ultimately, you know, when it comes down to it, all we're going to do is die. Like that's that's wherever all of us are going to end up. And, you know, whatever you can wield over other people until then kind of doesn't change a lot. Um, and, and, you know, the more power you have, the more you have to worry about maintaining it. And, like, and, and care in life is only misery. Like, it's just going to wear on you, you know, maintaining and fighting for that. So, like, what, what are you doing? Um, I am, I am a little, uh, confused by that last couplet there, uh, to be contented only with a sound wherein is neither peace nor life nor body found. And I don't know, I don't feel like I'm sure what that sound, the, the word that, you know. She I was thinking it was, it. I think she's referring back to care when she says this care and it's in italics is but a word, an empty sound wherein there is no soul nor substance found. I, I, that was my thought is that she's referring back to care, the care of, and, and care in life is only misery. So, so basically the care that comes along with your ambition, the, the stress and the struggle, um, that's what I thought she was referring to, but I don't know. But anyway, like I was saying, um, Travis, what's um, what was your you know kind of initial take, your first thoughts on this one? So, like I started to say, I mean, it's it's kind of a like I get I get the point, I get what she's saying about you know pursuing this, especially if you're using falsehood and whatever, um, and it's not really getting you anything. Um, but I think, I don't know, if you look at her image of the flower and, you know, she says how they did spring bud blow wither and die. That's really a fine line to apply to a human life. I mean, they spring, they bud, they blow, they wither and they die. Um, like she points out that we're not really any different from the flower. And yet she's claiming that each flower was sweet and she marked it. And she's saying that the flower, it, it seems to me, she's kind of saying the flower's life is beautiful and man's is foolish. It's, well, it's a pissing in the wind, if you will. Um, well, it's, um, if you want to, like, you know, compare, uh, you know, say, look at these flowers and then think about man's life. Um, well, you know, I don't have the, the verse reference handy, but I mean, th off the top of my head, that seems to be a little bit, you know, thinking about what Jesus said, you know, consider the lilies of the field, you know, they neither, uh, what is it? They neither spin, they spin, but Solomon and all his splendor was not arrayed as richly as one of these. And it's like, you know, they, they're, they're you know, out there. They're beautiful. They don't you know get upset. They don't you know get stressed over. Oh, what am you know? What am I going to wear? Oh, how am I going to accumulate more wealth? You oh, know, the stock. And, and yeah, and so and you know, like <laughs> Jesus said, if this is how God clothes uh, the grass of the field, you know, how much more is He going to take care of you? Stop worrying. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know whether Cavendish had that in mind when she wrote this, but it seems like an obvious connection to me. Like, 
stop worrying, stop stressing, stop fighting for, you know, power and accumulating things. And, you know, she never makes an explicitly, you know, well, there are, it's not a religious poem, but it's not an entirely irreligious poem either. Um, so. Well, there's, that brings up another point. It's, it's another interesting point. Like, I don't know what a Duchess of Newcastle, what that actually meant, but I always find it interesting when we're, we had another poem where you've got somebody who's a wealthy landowner talking about the people who strive. Now, granted, wealthy landowners strive, but I'm imagining that she pretty much had what she needed without striving. She spent her time writing poems and having parties. So it's curious to think about, you know, the state of the writer observing these other people striving to, to make their bread, to go to work. And, and she's here sort of putting, to some extent, putting that well, ambition down. And I, I recognize, like, I, I'm looking for the balance in what I'm saying. I mean, it's, you, you got to look for, like, so I, I, guess, I guess partially I look at it as, like, getting up in the morning and going to work requires a certain amount of ambition, you know, whether you're doing it because you want to feed your kids or whether you're making the sacrifice of I'm working this job, even though I make less money so that I can spend more time with my kids. There is ambition in that man does not exist without ambition. If you take his ambition away, there is no purpose that like we're talking about purpose. Like if you create a purpose for yourself and you say, I want to be there for my kids, that's purpose. That's your ambition. And so then that drives what you're doing. So I guess, I guess I'm just wrestling with the simple, the simplicity of the way she's expressing her idea and sort of, it, it seems to be coming at it sort of hard from one side rather than any kind of balance. And I can go with you on that. I do see where you're coming from. I said, but I think this is mostly aimed at like, you know, just glory hounds and sort of like the fame seekers, not people who are, you know, uh, purposefully driven, but people that are just, I want to be famous. I want to be known. I want to be this or that, or I just want to be rich. You know, it's basically all this effort without having a, a solid purpose. I think that's really what she's kind of coming at. Rather than, you know, the people who are out there toiling, because the people who are out there toiling, def they have a very definite purpose in what they're doing. You know, it may be we a need low to purpose. eat tomorrow. Yeah, it may be a low purpose. It may be a, you know, very repetitive and sort of, you know, intractable one and maybe not an inspiring one. But there's a purpose in what they're doing. I think, like I said, again, I feel like this is a society thing where because, you know, past a certain past a certain rung down you don't find people that are glory hounds you find people that are hungry and so you know i think also what she's writing about is more raised to the social strata she occupies you know she's talking about sort of like the uh the victorian gentry novel type people you know not the uh <laughs> You know, not the uh, the freaking diesel punk, you know, ghetto folk down the street. You know, this is, like I said, I feel like this is another one of those little nobility poems, rather than something that's aimed at the everyday person. Um. Well, and it's um. Even if, okay, so yeah, a couple things, you know, for me on what uh, Travis said. I mean, first of all, it is, um, you know, an unfortunate fact that almost by definition. You know, any writing we're going to have um, from, you know, out of the past is probably going to be from someone of the leisured class. Um, you know, you know, people who were, you know, basically, you know, just, you know, struggling to keep fed and warm don't have, you know, time to do a lot of writing. And even if they did, they weren't likely to get you know, most of them weren't likely to, you know, get published in a book and, and you know, and be kept around for a couple hundred years. Um, and, you know, another thing, and, you know, kind of like Nate said, 
you know, she she wasn't aiming at, you know, people who are just, you know, trying to, you know, uh, as the saying goes, keep body and soul together. It's, um, what is it? She says, you know, hoards up a mass of wealth, yet cannot fill his empty mind. Um, and, you know, it's like, okay, you know, he has, he has this house, but he's trying to make it bigger and, you know, more impressive. And he has, you know, all this wealth, but he's, you know, trying to add to the pile. Um, it's also kind of funny, and I do like that line, you know, hoards up a mass of wealth, yet cannot fill his empty mind. It's like, oh, you know, you managed to accumulate all this wealth, and yet, you know, what's going on upstairs? Are, have, you, have you, you know, made yourself wiser? Have you made yourself, you know, have you, you know, contributed anything to, you know, man's wisdom or knowledge? No, you just have a pile of money and you're kind of an, an empty, empty suit. Um, and there's plenty of those today still. Um, there's a lot of people so. that, that end up with a lot of money. And people are like, what are you going to do now? And they're like, I don't know. I never expected to make it this far. <laughs> I got a hand to keep on that. The man has a lot of money, but he is spending it in awesome ways. Like, he got all the money in pursuit of a wholly different goal. That is a man with a purpose. Who's that? Mars. Elon Musk. Who? Oh, yeah, he broke Space up. Like, Tesla, okay, Elon Musk. Boring company. Yeah. Which I um, love the boring was... company spells be not a flamethrower. It's a company that is actually there to dig tunnels, so it is a boring company. We decided to name it the boring company. <laughs> and for some reason they market flamethrowers, which are called not a flamethrower. That man is having fun with his money right there. But he's also uh, contributing in kind, so he is not the kind of person this is shooting at. Ugh. Well, it you know, what you were saying a minute ago, that actually reminds me of something I want to I, I spend too much time on TV tropes, um, because I just find it really interesting and amusing and that reminds me of something i had intended to look up and see if i could find um and if it's not there possibly build it but um the the yeah. like in what's that the elon musk tropes page no although there probably is one but uh, what i was thinking is like in every in um because I was, I was in uh i'm reading the hobbit right now and uh they kind of reference this kind of a conversation I want to see one about the conversation in some adventure or heist where they're like, okay, when we, when we, you know, get through this and I, and you get your share, what are you doing with your money, with your part of the treasure? Um, and I want to see if there's a trope about that conversation. Um, Cause if there's not, there needs to be, and I'll start it. Um, I mean, they sort of a thing like that in uh, the, recent like the matt damon italian job yes where that was, that talk was... About it, like, yeah this, this guy is such a dork they couldn't even figure out what to do with the money so he just did all the things we all said we wanted to do <laughs> yeah and uh, what what is it uh yet cannot fill his empty mind um uh yeah actually he's here to be an elon musk tv trope page <laughs> very sad But, um, uh, yeah, and, you know, kind of like, like Nate said, a lot of this is about, you know, what, what, per like, okay, you have a set amount of minutes here on Earth. What are you doing with them? What's your purpose? Um, and, and, you know, like she says, accumulating just accumulating a pile of gold or, you know, worldly power is a really crappy purpose. You got to, if that, if that's on, if that's your, if that's at the top of your list, maybe you should rethink that. Um, <sighs> yeah. And I've run out for the moment. Someone else. <laughs> I don't know. I think the latter part of the poem is interesting whenever she brings up care, you know. It is but a word, an empty sound, wherein there is no soul nor substance found. Um, 
Yet, yet as his heir, he makes it to inherit, and all he has he leaves unto the spirit. So it seems to be she's saying that he's leaving care. Like that's what he ha- that's all he has left is the care and the stress and the worry of and the ambition that's wrapped up in it, I guess. Um because really they go together. I mean, the ambition and the stress of pursuing that ambition are are one and the same in some ways. Um Well, and also like, you know, it's it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very, you know, pr- a real problem that all of us, you know, will see to some degree or other. Like, um, you can be, you know, <sighs> accumulating wealth is also like it, it, the more you have, the more you have to lose. Um, and so it's actually, um, there's another poem I recorded not long ago by, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, The Vagabond. And it's basically this guy saying like, you know what, just, you know, give me the open road, you know, I'll sleep outside, you know, under the stars, you know, by a campfire, or if I have to just, you know, give me the open road and let me be free. Um, which is almost exactly the opposite of the people she's talking about here. And, you know, he can say that because he has nothing. And so in having that nothing, he has nothing to defend. He has nothing, you know, he's, you know, he he has nothing that he's worried about losing. And so he doesn't have much in the way of worries. Um, and so it's, um, you know, kind of an interesting. Well, it's the it's uh, the it's the polar opposite of the the dragon. Uh, the poem about the dragon, which I can't for the life of me remember the title of. Never uh, you talking about the C.S. Lewis? Yeah. The dragon speaks. No, oh, well, I, I actually did remember it as it turned out. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, because it's like, yeah, I, I was young and I had a, I had a mate, and you know, things are great, and we, and you know, we we. We undertook romance and we were together and it was cool, but I wanted to be a dragon. So I ate her, became a dragon. And now I've got all this gold, but I can't sleep on it because it's cold and hard and the jewels poke me. And I'm always worried if I sleep, someone's going to come in and steal some of my gold. And if only I hadn't eaten my mate, she could help me watch it. But then she might take the gold and so I have to watch her. It, it, yeah, what is exactly what you're talking about is that all this all this richness leads to this paranoia of losing the richness. It, it was interesting when you made that point. What my mind immediately went to is Amarillo by Morning. Great song, George Strait, classic. Ignorant Philistine, I see you there shaking your head like I don't know what that is. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but no, he uh, in the last verse he's talking about you know. Uh, you know, he's basically like, yep, I'm going from this rodeo I was just at. I'm going to going forward to this rodeo I'm going to be at. And, uh, you know, he kind of recounts in the middle verse all the things he's lost along the way. Like, you know, his marriage fell apart. Uh, another romance went by the wayside. He's been hurt. He's lost, like, equipment and things. But at the same time, he's happy with his life, apparently. Uh, and he says, I... I ain't got a dime, but what I've got is mine. You know, I don't owe anybody anything. My pos- my few possessions are my possessions. You know, he says, I ain't rich, but Lord, I'm free. What do you and get so when you play he, a country song backwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't heard this one. Go ahead. I'll, I'll listen. You get your Even truck if... back, you get your dog back, you get your girl <laughs> back, you get your job back. Uh, nope. That's funny. <laughs> um, but but I think there's a lesson in that, though, too, because his life isn't free either. You know, he's he's crossed a lot of bridges, burned bridges, lost loves and romance and whatever else. His is an ambition, too. I mean, his ambition is to be free in riding horses or bulls, whatever the case may be. Um, and that's 
I mean, I guess, I guess the point I feel like is like that line of crossing from a lifestyle or even, but a lifestyle can be an ambition too. I like that line of crossing over to being the person just looking for wealth or riches or fame, like just wanting to be out there on that bull can be just an, as unhealthy an ambition if it's <laughs> destroying everything else. Um, it's a lot more likely to kill you. <laughs> you, make a, you actually make a really good point. And uh, actually one of sort of the uh, – <laughs> kind of a, a slightly down the generation uh, song points that out, which is Garth Brooks, much too young to feel this damn old. And he talks about, you know, kind of the, the less romanticized version of it, where he's like, yep, I am, you know, it's like, I don't have any friends. I don't have any family, really. You know, all I've got is. Just what I've got know, on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, all I have is, you know, the road and, you know, and sad old country songs and drinking. And that that's, you know, that and the, you know, that and the rodeo. And I'm just not so sure this is okay. You know, he says the the white line's getting longer and the saddle's getting cold and I'm much too young to feel this damn old. Yeah, and so he he makes the point that all this pursuit of freedom, and uh, you know, uh, Clint Black does the same thing. Desperado says all this freedom that you talk about is, it's just a coping device. He says freedom is just for talking. You know, the prison is walking through this world all alone. So you don't want to be the the rich glory hound or whatever who's you know built up this massive horde of wealth. You, know, you don't want to be the dragon. But at the same time, the vagabond ain't a great place to be either because you spend a lot of time cold and hungry. You have to you have to ecclesiast this whole thing, which is you need to work, you need to accumulate, but at the same time, you need to know when you have enough to just enjoy it and spend time, you know, eating, drinking, being merry with your friends, you know loving your wife and enjoying your days under the sun because you only get so many. And so, you know, honestly, both of the extremes are folly. It's the middle path. It's, like I said, it's temperance. You know, it's, I will temper my desire to be unencumbered and not have any responsibilities so that I can provide and produce and do useful work to support myself and my family because these are good things. But once I've done that, I'm also going to temper the desire to get more just to have and to show off so that I can enjoy the things I already do have. And so, like I said, it's not about having or not having. It's about balancing the having and the not having. There's an ice cream cone for you, which is a great <laughs> trope. Uh, so I'm going back to the couplet or whatever. To get this child of fame and this bare word, he fears no dangers, neither fire nor sword. All horrid pains and death he will endure, or anything can he but fame procure. I, it's actually kind of funny because I'm thinking of you know a, a, you know kind of current events uh, you know version of this, which is. Considering how pathetic the fame involved is, is is really awful. But like you know, there's you know, I, I made you know some jokes about this recently. There's you know, people there's uh, people from Reddit going off you know to Ukraine you know to fight for the cause, and you know posting selfies, uh, you know from what are supposed to be these really secure locations, and you know for the sake of a few internet upvotes getting themselves literally blown to pieces. It's like, you didn't think this one through, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it happens. It happens to the worst of us. Happened to ISIS. One of their cells was uh, posting tweets, and they didn't IP mask. Like, they didn't go through a VPN or anything. So, actually, some guys at a base that was part of my magcom was like, uh, hey, um, 
we got some IPs off of this, uh, this Twitter traffic from this ISIS cell, and we've like triple checked it. It's it's legit. That's where they're at. And they, so they rushed it up, and the wing commander was like, "Yeah, strike that!" And they blew it up and killed like two dozen ISIS fighters. <laughs> so you know, future lesson: if uh, you know, for those of you out there. Things go very badly, and uh, you are uh, part of a military struggle. Um, OPSEC. <laughs> Operational security is very, very important. Okay? And it definitely trumps being on Twitter or Reddit. Yeah, if your OPSEC is poor, uh, we're going to come loosen your butt cheeks. Uh. Detach them entirely. I still can't believe that. We got that one in a briefing a couple of days after it happened. We're like, no kidding. And then, like, three days later, it's all over Facebook, and I had to act like it's a surprise because. For a while, until uh. Mr. Raber. That was good stuff. Okay, so I I think I've said uh, most of the things I want to say here. Travis, how about you? I know I know something that I did not go to yet that I feel I have to. Okay. So there are two lines. There's two sets of couplets that I don't understand. It's, I mean, I'm not paying true attention i don't know if they're staying on rhyme and you know on meter uh wise but the two lines that bother me are as if he'd lived to all eternity and it, the first the line before it is yet built he houses thick and strong and high now she does like basic everyday rhyming for the entire poem except for this and she also does it with misery so They've got a similar sound, and they're supposed to rhyme with die and high. It's an old rhyme, whatever. Eternity and misery. Yeah. It, uh, uh, it could uh, just but, be a pronunciation change. I really don't know. Uh, I mean, that, but, that but, does so, but happen. The rhyming, the rhyming actually isn't what bothers me the most. It's, okay. the, it's the meter. I mean, it just screws everything all up. As if he lived to all eternity. There's no, there, it just, it just, you got this nice flowing poem and then you throw a word like eternity in there and it just chops it up. Well, it's, um, okay. So this is something I, I, uh, figured out a while back. It's, um, let's see. Yeah, built, he houses thick and, okay. Yeah. So it's roughly an, I, it's roughly iambic, which is what English tends to default to. Um, and, um, <laughs> Very, we're we're getting very into the weeds on this one in terms of uh, in terms of like you know rhyme and meter and, and things. Okay, it's roughly iambic, which is unstressed then stressed. And one thing I noticed a while ago is that in um, in syllable in sorry in words of more than three syllables, uh, three syllables or more, um, there's a. Pr- 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 what what it will usually do is every other syllable will have a a, a minor stress. Um, so it turn it t, um, and so the main stress in that word is on the turn. But then t, that last one, also has a a lesser stress, and like if if you. I know some. It's something you apparently kind of have to have an ear for, and I do. I know some people who have a very hard time like sorting these out. But like, if you say a you know four a four four syllable word, a multiple a, you know many syllable word, you'll see that it tends to um, be stressed, unstressed. Uh, con- constitution, constitution. Yeah, that uh, for constitution. That one's four. And it's on the second and another one on the fourth. Um, and so, uh, as if he'd live to all eternity. Yeah, that works for me. I I don't know. 
And Nate's just here like, I'm not an English major. What are you talking about? I'm not sitting here like that, actually. I'm sitting here thinking about the Constitution, how mad I am that they, you know, the copy I have on my phone says that anything in italics has been amended or superseded. And the whole part about the uh, Senate being elected by the state's uh, gov- like the state's uh, congressional houses is making me angry. No, that's way too far off topic. No, <laughs> we're not going there. <laughs> you said constitution. Uh, tra- I was just looking for a four syllable word. Um, but Travis, does that make sense? <laughs> It, I mean, it it makes sense. I'd have to work with it, but as if he'd lived. Oh, I still it it still doesn't work for me really, but that's all right. <laughs> because she messes with both rhyme and meter to a certain extent. So yeah. that's she's, no, I... she's she's clearly a good poet. She knows how to do it. She didn't have to use the word eternity. She could have used a couple of smaller words to make it sound better. I mean, well, I, even play, um, I even, I mean, I even played around with it. <laughs> well, and uh, as if he'd live see. beyond now. And, and anyhow, there's, there's options. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Honestly, I think if she, instead of she's, if she hadn't said if he'd live to all eternity, but live, you know, just live through eternity instead of making it d- d- two syllables going into eternity. If it had been maybe one, it would have smoothed out the meter a little bit better. But yeah, again, she's yeah. been dead, so I guess we can't really take it up with her. We'll let her off the hook. <sighs> okay, uh, so Nate, it was how her about ambition. You? Her ambition drove her to try to make it <laughs> work with eternity and misery in the poem. Uh, so, there you go. Nate, how about you? Any any last thoughts on this you want to get in before we close out? Last thoughts I want to get in before we close this out. Yeah. <clears throat> like I said, read Ecclesiastes. I cannot I cannot recommend that book enough. Um of all the things I've read in the Bible, I feel like that has made the biggest difference in my life. Which people are like, what about the Gospels? I was like, I was indoctrinated into the Gospels and the beliefs when I was like a fetus. So that all was, that's like, you know, it's a fish in water situation. You ask a fish what the water's like today, he's going to be like, the what? But reading Ecclesiastes kind of helped me to figure out a decent balance for life. And like I said, it really has, it made me a more thoughtful person about what I'm doing and what I want. And like I said, I find it to be a very interesting and useful book. And it basically is a blueprint for how to avoid being this guy. Or country music, which can you know do do much the same thing for you. Um. A lot of very mournful, contemplative music. Oh, which <laughs> okay. brings me back. I I, I I hate to uh, correct you on this. You're right. Clint Black does sing the song Desperado, but that was actually written and performed by the Eagles originally, and Clint Black countrified it. Just just so I you know. Better. So that's all I want to know about. <laughs> okay well um thank you uh for joining us tonight and um it's been fun and uh god be with you also with you